Hello, my name is Jordan Geese and I'm a PhD student in the Natural Resource Ecology and Management Department at Iowa State University. I'm here to talk to you today about the effect of prairie strip establishment in Iowa on birds, so let's go ahead and get started. Before we talk about our research and findings, I just wanted to give a shout out to Matt Stevenson, who's another PhD student in my lab under Dr. Lisa Schulte Moore. Some of the stuff we're going to be talking about today comes directly from his master's in dissertation research uh, as a part of the, of the research team looking at the effects of prairie strip establishment. So Prairie Strip started at Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge in Jasper County, Iowa, and essentially researchers were looking at comparing what happens when we restore 10% of a small watershed to tall grass prairie vegetation along the contours of the field uh, to compare that to 100% uh, no-till corn and soybean crop and see what the benefits, potential environmental benefits and others are uh, of doing that practice of restoring prairie strips. Some of the uh, results from that phase one of the prairie strips project include uh, the reduction in water runoff and soil loss, uh, as well as reduction in chemical runoff of phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, but one of the other things um, that they found was that those prairie strips, uh, even when uh, only restoring 10% of the landscape, they can potentially improve uh, habitat for beneficial insects and wildlife. And so just from that phase one, getting that result has kind of blossomed into what we, what we do now on uh, the phase two of the Prairie Strips project where we're now working on uh, commercial working farms throughout Iowa. And so grassland birds are the most imperiled uh, group of birds uh, in North America and probably the world. There are 31 species in North America. Um, since 1970, we've lost 700 million grassland birds, individual grassland birds, um, and 74% of the species in that group, uh, grassland birds, are in decline. And the main reason is habitat loss and pesticide, ex uh, pesticide exposure. And so pretty much with the industrialization of agriculture, uh, we've lost a lot of potential habitat for grassland birds to breed and nest in. Um, and there is also some direct mortality associated with the pesticides that we put on the landscape. And so prairie strips are potentially um, benefiting uh, this group of species, and this is the most obvious uh, uh, group of uh, wildlife that, um, as far as vertebrate wildlife go, that prairie strips could benefit. And so that's what we wanted to look at. So our four key questions um, that we wanted to examine as we um, started doing wildlife surveys uh, in the Strips Phase 2 project on working farms across Iowa is will wildlife use prairie strips as habitat first of all that's kind of the the baseline question and then are narrow strips of prairie running through crop fields actually high quality habitat or are we just luring those birds into those narrow strips just so, so that they can experience high mortality or maybe their nests uh, can experience lower nest success because there's often a lot of predators in prairie strips because it's kind of this linear narrow habitat um, also, how do they compare to existing conservation practices such as CRP or uh, low diversity contour strips or terraces or other, other uh, agricultural practices uh, aimed at uh, conserving soil and things like that? How do prairie strips compare to those? Are, is it a favorable comparison or not so much? Uh, and especially that last question to larger blocks of restored prairie. So um, historically, when we want to when we want to conserve uh, habitat for maybe declining wildlife species or grassland birds or what have you, uh, that we uh, aim to uh, protect large blocks of prairie, not just these these linear linear uh, narrow strips. And so, how do they hold up against large large blocks? Is an important research question. So the measures uh, that we'll look at today are bird density, nest density, and nest survival. And our, and you can also hear nest survival mentioned as nest success. It's essentially the same thing. And the overarching goal is to measure the general response of wildlife to prairie strip establishment and whether strips act as high quality habitat or ecological sinks. And we'll talk about this concept of an ecological sink here on the next slide. Essentially, in ecology, we have sources and sinks. Sinks are lower quality ecological habitats, and sources are uh, uh, high quality. Uh, populations cannot survive as well in ecological sinks, and they're isolated from other habitats, um, and they do not have a sustainable population. So essentially, uh, sources are net exporters of wildlife, and sinks are net importers, meaning that they uh, wildlife in sinks experience higher death rates than birth rates. 
And so sources are high quality and they produce a lot of young and those young disperse. And sometimes those young or uh, birds from other areas end up in sinks. And those sinks do not support sustainable populations, often because in birds uh, there's lower nest survival. Maybe there's more uh, predators in sinks or some other uh, uh, reasons that um, those nests are not experienced very, very high success. And so one of the uh, um, concerns about the Prairie Strips project is that we're just creating these low low quality sinks um, and we're kind of tricking birds into going into these low quality sinks and nesting um, even though that they're not actually going to have a higher high nest success and they're actually going to be net uh, n not very productive at all whereas if they would uh, have nested in a large block prairie they would have had high reproductive success and actually been uh, productive uh, as individuals. So our first study we'll talk about today is going to tackle the bird density question and uh, looking at the use, the general use of birds of prairie strips compared uh, to conventional crops. So the methods for this project, um, we've been doing bird point counts for five years from 2015 to 2019 uh, at nine farms across Iowa with prairie strips. Each site or each farm had both a conventional field with 0% prairie strips and a field with prairie strips. Each field has three to six stations in each field, and an observer, uh, including myself, which is pictured there, stands at one point for five minutes and identifies every individual bird and estimates the distance to that bird uh, within about 100 meters of, of the observer. I skipped ahead a little bit there. But this is what those bird point count stations look like when they're laid out in a field and so this is a site over in eastern Iowa and on the left there you can see our control field or our 100% conventional crop field versus our prairie strips field on the right and so they're often they often have the same amount of points and we're looking at the birds that use that field on the left compared to the amount of birds that will use the field on the right. We also have audio recorders and so this is an audio recording from a conventional crop field to kind of give you an idea of what that sounds like and the dichotomy between the two types of fields. So pretty quiet, now let's listen to a prairie strips field. And so just listening to that, we can, we can tell really obviously that there are a lot more birds, uh, especially singing birds, in prairie strips field fields compared to conventional crop fields. So I just like to use as a, as a little bit of a, uh, as a help to uh, kind of exhibit uh, that dichotomy between those. But let's actually get into the hard results. And so um, essentially what we do is we use those uh, birds that we observe in those two fields and we generate uh, grassland bird density estimates. And so this is th those 31 grassland bird species. Um, the conventional crops is on the on the left there in red and the density in crops with prairie strips is on in the yellow there and you can see that there's pretty much a threefold increase when you go from a conventional crop field to a field with prairie strips and so that's really good news especially for those grassland birds that are really imperiled right now. These are the most common grassland birds in prairie strips and you might recognize some of the names common yellowthroat, dick sisal, eastern meadowlark, red-winged blackbird, and western meadowlark. The two dick sisal and eastern meadowlark are listed as Iowa species of greatest conservation need and so those are species, all these species are actually in decline since the 60s but those two species are of special conservation need in the state of Iowa. So let's talk about red-winged blackbirds first. So we're going to get into individual uh, species densities. Red-winged blackbirds are the most common bird in North America, but they've actually uh, decreased quite a bit since the breeding bird survey started in 1966. We can see that red-winged blackbirds uh, increased quite a bit. And pretty much with red-winged blackbirds, if you put any type of grassy vegetation on the landscape, they're going to be able to utilize that and nest in it, which explains why there are so many red-winged blackbirds in prairie strips fields. How about dick sisals? Dick sisals have declined about 14% since the 1960s. Very similar response here. They uh, increase drastically just with the presence of prairie strips. And so just like red-winged blackbirds, putting a little bit of that uh, perennial native vegetation on the landscape really does, uh, does a wonder for these guys. Common yellowthroats are a, another species that use prairie strips quite a bit. Let's look at the response for those. Not quite as a, of a drastic uh, increase, but you can see that there is a noticeable increase in common yellowthroats, and yellowthroats require kind of thick, brushy vegetation, so especially prairie strips that are in those uh, third year plus um, are really going to benefit common yellowthroats. Meadowlarks, remember we have eastern and westerns. Uh, we included both in this slide here, so these are combined, so these are all meadowlarks, both species. 
And we can see there's a little bit of an increase um, in eastern and western meadowlark uh, density when you go from conventional crops to crops with prairie strips. And so um, just another species that benefits quite a bit. Now, let's talk about brown-headed cowbirds a little bit. So brown-headed cowbirds are what's called a brood parasite, meaning they lay eggs in the nests of other species. And oftentimes those species that uh, receive those cowbird eggs do not are not able to fledge their own young and will actually only fledge or produce um, the cowbird young. And so cowbirds are pretty much tricking other species to um, raise their young for them. And so this is a very, very advanced kind of uh, uh, evolutionary uh, behavior. Uh, cowbirds used to uh, follow around bison around the plains historically, but now with modern agriculture they can stay put. But these are a conservation concern to some declining species, including some of the grassland bird species. And so we wanted to look at uh, what how brown-headed cow, brown cowbirds are responding to the establishment of prairie strips. Are we putting more brown-headed cowbirds on the landscape, which might be unfortunate. And as you can see here, it's not kind of presented the same data-wise because it's it's the methods for estimating cowbird density are a little bit different. But we can actually see in our data we have more brown-headed cowbirds in conventional crop fields and crops with prairie strips. In reality, that those numbers are probably um, pretty close to each other as far as the number of cowbirds in each of those two uh, types of fields. Uh, but there was not uh, an obvious drastic increase in the amount of cowbirds in prairie strips. And so that was a little bit of a relief uh, because that is going to lessen our, our uh, um, worries about creating an ecological sink because ecological sinks might also have a lot of cowbirds that are just parasitizing uh, those nests of other birds. So let's talk about another study. So this is uh, going to uh, factor in some of Matt Stevenson's work. Remember, he's looking at bird nest density and nest survival of prairie strips. So Matt, uh, May through August 2015 to 2019, um, he uses double observer plot searches in different on-farm grassy features, including prairie strips. And we will get a look at uh, an idea of what that looks like on a GIS map here on the next slide. But essentially, he would look for nests in 300 plots on 11 farms around central Iowa, and about 150 of those are actively searched in a given year. The nests are revisited often to determine how long they survive. So they find the nest, they find the nest within a plot, which uh, allows them to estimate a nest density. So we had bird density, and now we're looking at nest density. And then they monitor those nests until they either succeed or fail so that he can get a good idea of, of the reproductive success of birds and prairie strips versus other gr uh, grassy features on farms, such as terraces, waterways, etc. So here's a map of what those plots and what those nests look like. So the plots are the different colored boxes there, and then the the uh, points are actual nest locations. And so this is at a farm in Wright County, uh, Wright County, Iowa. And you can see at the top left there, those red boxes are actually just plots uh, in crop fields, conventional crop fields. And then the other colors are uh, plots in different types of grassy features. So for example, on the bottom right, there's a CRP, kind of a triangular, triangular uh, CRP block field. And the other ones are prairie strips, the yellow and the light yellow. Um, they also look for nests um, opportunistically so that nests don't have have to occur in those plots, uh, but the nests that do occur in those plots contribute to the nest density uh, measure metric that we're, that we're trying to get at. But all of those nests that he found or his crew found um, would have been monitored until they succeed or fail. Here's a photo of what those look like, and so that is a Dixissel nest with uh, five eggs, um, and this is in a prairie strip. You can see the, the bergamot that it's growing in there. Those different eggs, there's three Dixissel eggs, which are the which are the light blue color, and then the speckled brown eggs are the brown-headed cowbirds. So this uh, concern about an ecological sink, we can really answer a lot of that question with the nest survival and nest density. So the bird density study, we're putting birds on the landscape, which is great. There's more birds in fields with prairie strips than conventional crop fields. But how are they reproducing and are they being productive while they're there during the breeding season? Well, if we look at red winged blackbird nest densities, we're seeing that blackbirds nest in high density in strips and filter strips compared to other uh, conservation grassy features on farms and so you can see there it goes terrace uh, establishing strips grass blocks contour strips mature prairie strips and filter strips on the x-axis of that graph and we're seeing that they are nesting at really high densities in those last two um, land cover types compared to others and here's dick sissels and you the x-axis has uh, switched around a little bit there but you can see the mature prairie strips are outperforming um, the other land cover types uh, on the x-axis and so okay we're putting more birds on the landscape those birds are nesting in higher densities on the landscape in fields with prairie strips how about nest survival or nest success rate 
And so this is a measure of uh, the overall nest success. What, what, are, what are the probabilities that a uh, bird, given that it's nesting in a grassy feature, what are the probabilities that it's going to survive? And so you can read the land covers there on the x-axis on the bottom, but a prairie strips are essentially the second highest nest success rate uh, for, uh, this is red-winged blackbirds, and so um, they're just behind large patch prairie when it comes to nest success. So they're outperforming low-diversity prairie strips, I guess we could just say low-diversity grass strips, large patch grasslands, waterways, and terraces, so they're performing really well and pretty comparable to large patch prairie. Well, let's look at dick sissels now. Prairie strips are still outperforming, looks like low diversity strip, uh, waterway and terrace. Now large patch prairie is a little bit better than them and so is large patch grassland, which uh, could be expected because dick sissels require a little bit more uh, habitat than red winged blackbirds, but still prairie strips are outperforming um, some of those other conservation practices. So kind of our takeaways, we have more birds in fields with prairie strips, which is great. That's kind of one of our first baseline questions. There are a few species that respond really strongly to prairie strips, including dick sissels, common yellowthroats, and red-winged blackbirds. There are more bird, uh, bird nests in fields with prairie strips, and we showed that with the red-winged blackbird and dick sissel results. And then birds in general also have greater nest success in prairie strips compared to other lower diversity um, land cover types or conservation practices that farmers could be doing in Iowa. So prairie strips are, are doing a, a good a uh, good thing for for birds because we're putting more birds on the landscape they're nesting in higher densities on the landscape and they're experiencing higher nest survival on the landscape so probably not an ecological sink so really addressing that concern um, and that's a good thing so if you want to uh, know, learn a little bit more about this project i maintain instagram and twitter accounts and so there's my little handle there at burden biologist so feel free to follow along there you can also visit our Prairie Strips website uh, listed there in the first bullet point, or you can email us with any questions or concerns you have at prairie strips at iastate.edu. And also, the Prairie Strips account uh, maintains its own Twitter page, and so you can follow that. There's a pretty good following there, um, and they're often retweeting um, other findings and tweets from researchers that are posting to Twitter, so that can be a really good resource to keep up with some of the research findings on the Prairie Strips project. We have 37 partners and funders for Prairie Strips, and those could be large funders, or small funders and 20 stakeholder advisory committee members and those are all acknowledged on the website. We have lots of partners including NGOs, anything from NGOs to federal partners like the USGS, NGOs like White Rock Nature Conservancy and so we're really thankful to have all our research partners and people helping out, help us, helping us out with um, our findings on the Prairie Strips Project. Lots of great funders, too, everything from private to gover governmental agencies, and um, a lot of money uh, is, is, is given to um, researchers and allows us to use a lot of resources to get at what we want to. And so all of the, all of the bird research that you've uh, learned about today is funded from a lot of different places, and we'd definitely like to thank all our funding agencies for that. We also have a large stakeholder advisory committee, and so um, a lot of those are repeats from previous slides here, but we work with a lot of people and we're being advised uh, on, the, on the regional scale as well as the, as the uh, federal scale. And so thank you to all of our uh, partners, funders, and our stakeholder advisory committee for making all of this possible. And that's going to do it for me today. Thank you.